Okay, uh, hello everyone and welcome to this talk that is part of the MSU Science Festival 2021. Uh, my name is Dr. Elias Eide. I'm a, a research associate at the Physics and Astronomy Department at Michigan State University. And uh, today I will be uh, telling you about the search for extraterrestrial life as we explore the cosmos together. Uh, so before starting any uh, talk about astronomy, usually I like to introduce uh, three uh, parameters or scales. Okay, this is not moving. Sorry, I'll try just to make sure that the... Okay. Let's start again. Okay, so I'd like you to, to introduce three scales, which are the distance, uh, the numbers, and the time. So starting with the distance, uh, if we are in our very uh, local, let's say, environment, which is the solar system. So this is an artistic impression of what the solar system uh, looks like. Uh, of course, uh, the size, uh, sizes and the distances are, of course, uh, not to scale. Uh, so here's Earth that we see, it's the third planet from the sun. And the Earth is at a distance of around 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles from the sun. Uh, you can see that immediately we jump to very large distances and therefore astronomers to make it easier, they call this distance one astronomical unit or an astronomical unit just to, uh, uh, to avoid using very large number. And this is still, we are in our solar system. We haven't even tried to go outside of our solar system, but let's make this trip and go to the nearest star to us, which is Proxima Centauri. Of course, uh, Proxima Centauri cannot be seen from the Northern Hemisphere, can only be seen from the Southern Hemisphere. And Proxima Centauri is at a distance of 4.2 light years away from us. Uh, light year is not a measure of distance. It's, um, it's not a measure of time, it's a measure of distance. It is the distance traveled by light during a year. So light, the fastest, uh, speed we know of in the universe, 300,000 kilometers every second, takes 4.2 years to reach Proxima Centauri. In other words, if you have a, a spaceship that can travel in the speed of light, you need around 4.2 years to reach Proxima Centauri. And so far, it is impossible, of course, to uh, travel in the speed of light. But this also means that whenever we are studying stars in the galaxy or the universe, we are always studying the past of these stars. So, uh, for example, every time we are looking at Proxima Centauri, the light that has reached us left Proxima Centauri four years ago or 4.2 years ago. And therefore now we will be seeing how Proxima Centauri was four years ago and vice versa. If there is, for example, uh, some intelligent civilization on Proxima Centauri, looking at Earth now, they will see how Earth was four years ago. And actually there is a system of planets around Proxima Centauri that has been discovered recently. And let's hypothetically consider that one of these planets has an intelligent civilization on it with a very large telescope, much larger than this telescope that they have. And they are looking at the uh, at planet Earth right now, at this moment, what they will see is not a planet struggling with a pandemic, a global pandemic that is crippling the entire planet. They won't see people on the streets wearing masks and wearing with masks and everyone wearing a, a, a mask and social distancing. However, what they will see right now is our planet, how it was, four years ago, so back to the year of 2017, where the global population was somehow living in La La Land, not aware of the danger that is waiting for us in four years of the future. This applies to all the stars in the, in the, in the galaxy and the universe. And now let's make the same experiment. 
but with a star that is 51.4 light years away from us. Again, when we're looking at the star right now, we will see how the star was 51.4 years ago. And if there is a, again, some intelligent civilization on a planet around the star looking at Earth right now, they will see how Earth was 51.4 years ago. Why this particular number? Because 51.4 years ago will bring us back to the date of the 20th of July, 1969. And instead of this intelligent civilization pointing their telescope towards Earth, if they point their telescopes toward the moon, they will be able to watch right now Neil Armstrong and the crew of the Apollo 11 mission placing the first human step on the lunar surface. So they will be able to watch right now the lunar, lunar landing live. If they can record it and send it to us, then they will be able to debunk all the conspiracy theories about the lunar landing. But of course, when they send it to us, we'll only uh, receive it 51 years from now. Our galaxy, the Milky Way, again, this is an artistic impression. We cannot take photos of the Milky Way because we live inside of it. The Milky Way is 100,000 light years across, which means if you have a ship in, that can travel in the speed of light, it will take you 100,000 years to go from one side of the galaxy to the other side of the galaxy. This is how large our galaxy is. And you can see that the sun is just a small dot in this galaxy. Now we want to make the trip outside of our galaxy to the nearest galaxy to us, which is called Andromeda or M31. Andromeda is at a distance of 2.5 million light years away from us. Which means whenever we are looking at Andromeda right now, tonight, if we go out and look at Andromeda, we'll see how Andromeda was 2.5 million years ago. And again, same hypothetical assumption. If there is an intelligent civilization somewhere in Andromeda, it's a very, 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 very large telescope pointing it towards our planet Earth. They will see right now how Earth was 2.5 million years ago, which means they won't see any intelligent civilization or people driving cars or using planes or even attempting to explore the space around them. But what they will see is this. This is one of our human ancestor. It's called Homo habilis and was roaming the eastern side of the African continent around 2.5 million years ago. Homo habilis means the handyman because this is one of our first ancestors that started to use tools. Now they say that uh, a picture is worth a thousand words. And indeed, I'm going to show you a picture now that might have saved me all the words that I try to use now to portray to you how large our universe is. So the team that is responsible for the NASA Hubble Space Telescope decided to conduct an experiment and they pointed the Hubble Space Telescope towards a very small patch in the sky, a dark patch in the sky. I'm showing it here in this rectangle and you can see it in comparison to the size of a full moon. It's a very small patch in the sky. And they pointed the Hubble, to Hubble Space Telescope towards this patch in the sky for days and weeks and months, collecting images and photons and data. And after weeks of collecting data, this is what they got. It's called the Hubble Ultra D field. And each dot in this photo is actually a galaxy on its own. Some are larger, some are smaller than our Milky Way galaxy. And some of them are as far as billions of light years away from us. I think this is one of the most influential photos in history. And it just put everything in perspective to us. 
and somehow shows us how insignificant we are in this universe. The universe or the observable universe is uh, expected to be around 93 billion light years in diameter. I'm saying the observable universe because the universe could be much bigger than that. It's just that the universe is not old enough for the light that is traveling from these very distant galaxies to reach us. Uh, and again, recently astronomers found out that the universe is also expanding. So it's expanding and accelerating expansion. I say recently, like beginning of the 1900, like uh, 20th century, they, they found out that they're expanding. And more recently, they found out that it's accelerating and expansion. Now let's talk about numbers. And you already saw that numbers are really too large here. But our galaxy, again, the Milky Way, has around 200 billion stars other than our sun. So definitely not unique in this galaxy or in the universe. 200 billion, that's two followed by 11 zeros. The observable universe is estimated to have around 100 billion galaxies other than our Milky Way. Some are much larger, some are much smaller. But on average, if you want to estimate the number of stars in the observable universe, we just have to multiply 100 billion by 100 billion, which will give us one followed by 22 zeros. It's a very large number. I don't know even how to pronounce it. This is just give us a rough estimate of the number of stars in our universe. And finally, with time, the average lifetime of a human being is around, uh, uh, it's around eight years. And this is, of course, nothing compared to the age of stars and the time scales in the universe. So, for example, a star like our sun lives for billions of years. So our sun has been around for 4.5 billion years since its birth. And it will stay around for another four to five billion years before it starts dying when it runs out of fuel. Don't worry, yeah, our sun will die, but don't worry about it at all. It will only happen in like four, four or five billion years in the future. So definitely will not be here. The universe has been around for around 13.7 billion years since the Big Bang. And this is the most accurate estimate of the age of the universe, or recent most accurate estimate of the age of the universe. And again, this is 13.7 billion years. It's very difficult to comprehend. So today we want to talk about the exoplanets. And when I say exoplanets, I mean by that planets that are outside of our solar system orbiting other stars than our sun. So we're talking about exoworlds, worlds that are outside of our solar system. And astronomers are continuously searching, searching for these new worlds for exoplanets. And to do that, they use different methods. And today we're going to learn about two of these methods which are called transit and radial velocities. I'm going to start with the first one, which is called transit. And uh, as per the name of this method, the method relies on observing a certain star for extended period of time, and then waiting for any dips in the brightness or the light of the star. Because when we have a planet, that is passing in front of the star, it blocks some of the starlight, which will cause a very small dip in the brightness of the star, temporary dip before the brightness of the star recover again. And when you see this happening again and again, when observing certain star, we can learn that there's something that is periodically blocking the light from the star, which means it's orbiting the star, and therefore we can conclude that there is actually a planet or an exoplanet orbiting around the star. Sometimes, or most of the time, stars have more than one planet. And, uh, and therefore we see this uh, very complex 
uh, dips. So it's not only one dip, there are like multiple dips. Uh, but astronomers managed to develop the methods that they can uh, disentangle between these different dips and asso associate them with different planets. So here we are seeing a, a system that have three planets, and we can see that this dip actually consists of three dips. And, uh, and this happens when these planets pass in front of their host stars. From these dips, if you have a planet passing in front of the star, from the dip, we can learn a lot of stuff because the duration between these two dips means that the planet has made a complete orbit around the star and therefore we can derive the year on this planet from the shape of the dip and how wide it is. We can learn about the radius of this planet, the size, even its mass, and from the shape of the dip, we can also tell about the, uh, if this planet has an atmosphere or not, and therefore learn about the characteristic of this planet. As I said, sometimes the dips could be very complicated, but still astronomers manage to develop the methods that could help them to differentiate between these dips and figure out not even discovering planet, but planetary systems around stars, so multiple planets. The Kepler, the NASA science measure, has been one of the leading uh, uh, missions in discovering exoplanets. This mission operated between years 2009 and 2018, so for around nine years. And the mission was intended to observe a large number of stars in our solar neighborhood looking for this dips in the brightness of the star to, uh, uh, to, to search for exoplanets around them. And during its nine years mission, a Kepler found around 2,662 exoplanets. And astronomers are still uh, mining the Kepler data in order to find more and more exoplanets. The successor of that, of Kepler, it's called TESS, or short for Transiting Exoplanet Survey Satellite. This is a new satellite launched in 2018 and is still operating today and ex expected to operate for a long period of time. TESS is equipped with a very advanced camera, which also are uh, monitoring some parts of the, of the sky. So here's, for example, we are seeing the coverage of the TESS mission on the celestial sphere. And uh, TESS uh, observes some parts of the sky for almost the entire year, some parts of the sky for a shorter time. And while observing this part of the sky, TESS would be actually observing the stars in, this, in, the, in, in the night sky and, and, uh, and the sky in general, and then looking for dips in their light curves or in their brightness. TESS main aim is to find Earth-like objects, so uh, Earth-like planets, so planets like Earth, which might be in the habitable zone around their host stars. So habitable zone is a zone around the star where the planet is not very close to the star, so it's too hot, and not very far from the star, so it's, it's very cold or it's too cold. So it is in a zone where the temperature is mild enough to uh, have the possibility of life evolving on this planet, and therefore it's called the habitable zone. So far, TESS has discovered more than 100 exoplanets, but astronomers have just started toward analyzing and studying the, the, the data that TESS is, is offering us. Of course, when, when, when a satellite or a remission like this find exoplanets, usually they call them candidate exoplanets because they, they, they see the dips and the, and, the, and, the, and the light curve. But of course, it's very expensive to monitor for long time certain star with these satellites. So therefore, the, the satellites will provide us with candidate, then uh, we use telescopes on Earth, ground-based telescopes to monitor these these stars for an extended period of, a period of time and confirm the presence of exoplanets. And this could be done with telescopes uh, 
like large telescopes, like professional telescopes, and even this could be done with small telescopes. Actually, high school students all over the, the globe have uh, uh, like do projects using small telescopes to confirm and find exoplanets. And I think this is very cool for, for school students to actually discover a new world and confirm the discovery of a new world. And here at MSU, uh, our under astronomy undergraduate students use the MSU campus observatory to follow up uh, on candidate uh, exoplanets and, and try to confirm these uh, new worlds actually. And they have done a really fantastic job doing this. The other method that I'm going to, or the second method I'm going to talk about to find exoplanets is called uh, radial velocities. Uh, radial velocity uh, is, a, is a method that rely on a phenomenon called the Doppler effect. So what is the Doppler effect? Now let's uh, think of a, uh, of a, uh, an ambulance that is uh, traveling on the streets and we are, or like driving on the street and we are standing by the side of the street. If this, this ambulance is going towards us, what happens is that the sound wave emitted by the siren of the ambulance gets compressed. And when the ambulance move away from us, the sound waves that are emitted by the siren gets elongated. And we can notice usually a change in the pitch of the sound from the siren when the ambulance is coming towards us and then when it goes away from us. Because what happens is that the frequency or the wavelengths of the sound wave have changed because they are emitted by a moving object that is moving towards us initially. So the, the wavelengths of the wave gets compressed. And then when it goes away from us, the wavelengths of the wave gets elongated. And this same phenomena also occur for any type of waves such as light waves. So when we have a star or an object in the sky that is emitting light, but is moving towards us, the light emitted by the, the wavelengths of the light emitted by this object gets compressed or gets shorter. And if this object is moving away from us, the wavelengths emitted by this, uh, the wavelengths of the light emitted by this object becomes longer. So, and therefore the, the, the color of the light change. Why the color of the light change? Because if you look at the electromagnetic spectrum, these are all the wave, of the electromagnetic spectrum that we know of. So starting from the gamma rays, X-rays, these are the high energy waves, but they have the shortest wavelengths and then ultraviolet. And then we have the visible, which is a very small part of the electromagnetic spectrum. And the visible consists of all the colors of the rainbow that we know of, starting from the violet and the blue waves, which are also the shorter waves in the visible spectrum. And then all the way to the reds, which are the, which are characterized by a longer wavelength. And then we go to the infrared and then the microwave, uh, the radio waves and the microwaves, which are longer and longer and longer. So what happened is that if a wave, which is characterized by a wavelength becomes shorter, the wavelength becomes shorter, we say that the waves is blue shifted. Why blue shifted? Because the blue in our visible spectrum, the blue colors represent the shorter waves. So as so the wavelengths get shorter, we say it's a blue shifted. And as the wavelengths get longer, when the object is moving away from us, we say it is red shifted because it's somehow turning into a redder color. This is of course in the visible spectrum. And this is actually the word used by astronomers. So if we have an object that is going towards us, we see we say that the light that is coming from this star or from this object is blue shifted, it's getting compressed and it's changing its color to the blue, bluer colors. And if an object is going away from us, this, uh, the, the wavelength gets elongated, becomes more longer, so it becomes redder and therefore the astronomers say the light is red shifted. Now, in order to study the spectrum of a star, we use something called our instrument called the spectrometer or a spectrograph. This instrument acts, acts like a prism. So 
when uh, so it captured the light coming from a star and then it spread it into the rainbow of color or wavelengths. So when we have a light coming from, for example, light bulb and go through a spectrometer or a prism, we see the light spreading into the color of the rainbows. We call it a continuous spectrum where there is all the colors. But, as, but scientists notice something that when a light goes through a container of gas, body of gas, while it's traveling, before going through the, the spectrograph, the light coming out from the spectrograph will be spread into all the colors, but it would be missing some sur very certain specific colors. We call them absorption lines, or this is an absorption spectrum. Where does this very specific uh, colors uh, go? Well, they have been absorbed by the atoms in this body of gas. And these atoms don't absorb every light, they absorb very specific colors of the light. So we see some missing colors from very certain missing specific colors in the spectrum that we get. Same when a, a light coming from a star and travel through the atmosphere of the star. What happens is that the atoms in the atmosphere of the star will absorb some of the light. And therefore, when we observe the star using a spectrograph or a spectrometer, and we get the spectrum of the star, we see that we have, of course, a continuous spectrum with all the colors, but hey, there are some colors missing. You know that these colors missing are absorbed by some elements, by some gases in the atmosphere of the star. Now, because we can do this experiment in the lab, what astronomers, what scientists did is they bring different body or container of gas. Some have helium, some have nitrogen, some have oxygen, and they shine a light into this container of gas. And then they see which colors are missing from the spectrum, from the continuous spectrum. And therefore they managed to identify for each body of gas, for each element like sodium or mercury or lithium, et cetera, which colors, which very specific colors are missing from the spectrum. And then we take these charts and we compare them to the light coming from the stars when we observe them with a spectrometer. And we see that, hey, there's the same color that is missing when the light passes through a container of hydrogen. And then we know, hey, there's hydrogen in the atmosphere of the star, and there's oxygen, and there's nitrogen, etc. by just comparing these charts with the spectrum of light that we are receiving from the star. And these absorption lines have also another role in helping us discover exoplanets. So they don't only tell us about the chemical composition, which elements are present in the atmosphere of the star, but also they help us to discover exoplanets around star. Why? Because as we just said, if an object is going away from us or towards us, the color of the light changes. It gets blue shifted or red shifted, turns a little bit bluer or a little bit rather depending on if it's going away or towards us. And if a star is actually doing some rotation, if we have, for example, two stars, because a lot of stars in the galaxy are actually not one star, not single star, but two stars orbiting their center of mass. Our eyes cannot tell them apart, but we can see this in telescopes. And most of the stars are two stars orbiting their center of mass. So if a star is going towards us and then away from us and then towards us and away from us, we see that the light that is coming from the star getting a little bit bluer and then redder and bluer and redder. And what also changed in, in color is these absorption features, is these absorption lines that are absorbed by the gases in the atmosphere of star. We expect like the hydrogen, for example, absorption features, the, the colors that are absorbed by the hydrogen element to be missing at a very specific color because we, we have the charge from the lab, we can compare them to them. But then we see that this color, this, uh, this missing color moved a little bit to the red and then a little bit to the blue and then a little bit to red. And then we know that this star is actually 
doing some kind of a, an orbit. It's going towards us, then away from us, towards us, and then away from us. This also happens when there is a star with a planet around it. Because for example, for the sun and Jupiter, we all think that Jupiter is like Earth, like all the other planets are doing a orbit around the sun. But this is not very accurate. Jupiter and all the other planets are actually orbiting their center of mass with the sun. So for example, Jupiter and the sun are orbiting their center of mass, which happen to be closer to the sun, much closer to the sun, because the sun is the more massive object in the system. And therefore what actually happens is that Jupiter looks like it's doing an orbit around the sun. And what the sun does is it's, it, it wobbles in its place around the center of mass. So it's like it's wobbling in its place. And this is very important because when the star with a planet around it is wobbling in its place due to the orbit around the center of mass, the light coming from the star gets slightly blue shifted and slightly red shifted. Slightly blue shifted is very small because it's a very small wobble of the star around the center of mass. But what astronomers have now what like they developed the instruments that are capable of measuring this very small shift in the light between red shifted and blue shifted due to the wobble of the star. And from this very small shift in the colors of the light, we are able to tell that, hey, there's an exoplanet around the star that is causing it to wobble in its place. And we are also now capable of discovering multiple exoplanets around the same star because each of them will affect the affect the star uh, to wobble in a different in a, in a different way so we can also disentangle the presence of multiple exoplanets around the star from this small wobble that the star does from these two methods and several other methods since 1992, astronomers have discovered more than 4,341 exoplanets today. And this number is changing almost every week. And based on this number from our exploration of our solar neighborhood around us in the galaxy, we can tell that most of the stars have planets around them. And therefore there should be several hundred billions of exoplanets in our galaxy alone. This is a very large number, right? So we have several hundred billions of planets in our galaxy. And this is not a new, even before discovering exoplanets, scientists and astronomers knew that there should be plenty of planets in our galaxy because our sun is not a unique star. It's just one out of hundreds of billions of stars. So a very famous scientist called Enrico Fermi has uh, several questions over a, a random chat uh, back in the, in, the, in the 50s. And he said, there should be hundreds of billions of stars and planets in the galaxy and universe. And there should be also billions of Earth-like planets around these stars. So planets that could host life, for example, or even intelligent life. And if some of these intelligent life managed to master inter interstellar travel, the Milky Way galaxy should be Rome, it should be full with interstellar traveler. However, so far we haven't found any. And therefore, Enrico Fermi asked a very famous question where is everybody? Which later became known as the Fermi paradox. Of course, it's not an actual paradox, but it's a question worth asking. Now, before I start to try to answer this question, where is everybody? It's very important to differentiate between two uh, terms that I'm going to use, which are life and intelligent life. So when I say life, life could be any form from uh, uh, single cell organisms to like more complex form of life. And I think single cell organism is not something very special. For example, uh, and, and why is that? Because for example, the ingredient for, for life in general 
are very abundant in the universe. So the ingredient of life are what? Oxygen, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and other elements. And these elements are very plenty in the universe, but how did they form? Well, when the universe started with a Big Bang, the universe was mostly made of hydrogen and helium. But later on, when stars started to form, they started forging new elements in their cores, like carbon and oxygen and nitrogen. And when these stars also exploded as supernovae, these early massive stars exploded as supernovae, they formed even more heavier elements, like most of the elements that we know of in the periodic table. And then these elements, because of these explosions, were spread across the universe to form new stars and new planets and new life. So basically all the elements that form our, our bodies, like carbon and oxygen, are made in the core of stars, are forged in the cores of stars and during star explosions. So when we say we are all made of stardust, it's not a cliche, it's a very accurate term actually. Because as I said, every atom in your body came from a star that died billions of years ago. And the atoms in your right hand probably came from a different star than the atoms in your left hand. Just how poetic is that? Now on earth, single, life, single cell organisms took around a billion years to start forming after the creation of our planet or the formation of our planet. And uh, this is not a very long time. It's actually a relatively short time relative to the age of the universe. So single cell organism seems not to be a very difficult uh, form of life to form. And I expect that because the uh, elements that constitute the basic ingredient of life like carbon and oxygen, etc., are very abundant in the universe. They are the most abundant in the elements in the universe after hydrogen and helium. And because there are plenty of exoplanets out there, and because that we know that there are plenty of these exoplanets or, or orbit their host stars in what we call the habitable zone. So in a zone that is that where life could potentially be present, where atmospheres could 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 uh, survive and where life could prosper. Therefore, single cell organisms should be almost everywhere in the galaxy and the universe. There should be plenty of planets which have single cell organisms. I would make a bolder statement and say even in our solar system, there might be some form of life around one of the moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And I expect a discovery like this to be announced in the next 20 years or so. However, when we talk about intelligent life, intelligent life is more life that is capable of either interstellar travel or at least space exploration or space communication. And this form of life is of course much more complex. And it took on earth around three additional billion years from single cell organism to start like for, for, for an intelligent life to evolve. And some people might ask a question, is it possible that this form of life on earth is unique? And I don't think it's a, it's a very odd question. It's actually a valid question because throughout the evolution of life on earth, there were some a probable events that occurred that led to the evolution of intelligent life. One of them uh, happened around 65 million years ago when dinosaurs were roaming earth and mammals, the early mammals looked like something like a rodent or a big rodent. And what happened around 65 million years ago was a global extinction event probably caused by the impact of a comet, which led to the extinction of most of the species on Earth, including the dinosaurs. And this gave a chance for mammals to prosper 
and evolve on Earth? And therefore, one question is, is it possible that maybe if the comet did not hit Earth or this global extinction event did not happen, is it possible that the evolution of intelligent life on Earth might not have happened, or at least maybe delayed? We don't know. The other improbable event is more linked to our direct evolution from our ancestors, the great apes. This event happened when the great apes, our ancestors, were still living on trees in forest in Africa and in Asia. But what happened on the eastern uh, coast of the African continent was a rift, a ge geological rift known as the East African Rift, which caused a, a, an emergence of sequence of mountains that blocked the rain to reach the inner parts of the African continent, leading to the, uh, if you want, deforestation of this part of the African continent, which turned into savannas. This forced our early ancestors to leave the trees and start roaming the savannas. And in order to be able to see predators from far away, this forced our ancestors to start walking upright. And walking upright was a very important part of our evolution because this gave our ancestors the chance to use their hands more and use tools and eventually, eventually invent or discover fire. And when they discovered fire, invented fire, they started cooking their meat, which actually, actually uh, uh, contributed a lot to the evolution of our brain. It, it has uh, really accelerated the evolution of our brains. And a lot of people think that if not for the East African Rift, could it be possible that the evolution of the brain of the great apes into something more complex like us, Homo sapiens, might have been delayed? Could very well be actually, because if we compare the great apes in the East African continent compared to the great apes in the Southeast Asia, the great apes in Southeast Asia are still living on the face. They are still living in forests like orangutans, and they are not as advanced as Homo sapiens. So again, this is a question to ask about whether life on Earth is unique. But given the large number of exoplanets in our galaxy alone, someone would still think that, hey, there are billions of exoplanets and therefore there could be chance of billions of life evolving on different planets. And I know it looked a, a little bit improbable for intelligent life to evolve on Earth, but this could also happen on other planets. And therefore the question of where is everybody is still a very viable question. And now quickly, I'm gonna go through some answers to try to, uh, uh, like uh, I would like also to hear your 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 thoughts and the and the and the comments on the Facebook and in the chat section here on uh, on on Zoom to to try to think where is everybody and why we haven't found them or they not they haven't visited us. Well, the first option is that maybe they are not advanced enough. Maybe there are some some life out there. It is evolving, but it did not reach the point of being capable of interstellar travel. We are not still capable of interstellar travel on here on Earth, and it could be the case on other planets. It could be that intelligent life don't last too long, and I somehow like I'm convinced uh, of this uh, of this possibility the most because here on Earth we can see that the technological advances are going much faster than the moral advances. So it could be that an intelligent civilization is always doomed by self destruction. So if an intelligent civilization only lasts, for example, a few thousand years or a couple of thousand years, this is very short compared to the age of the universe. The universe has been around for 13.7 billion years. So a few thousand years, for example, for example, if life on Earth 
led to self-destruction because of pollution or disease or some nuclear wars, uh, life on Earth would have, intelligent life on Earth would have lasted for less than a thousand years actually. And therefore this is like very small fraction or like compared to the age of the universe. Actually, let's just make an experiment and put the entire age of the universe in one year. So starting from the big bang on the 1st of January, this is New Year's day. Then in March, three months later, our Milky Way started to form. In August, already half year later, more than half year later, the sun and planets start to form. In November, we're already in November, the first multicellular organisms start to form on Earth. And now we're in December. We're already last month of the year. On December 17, the emergence of first vertebrae. On December 18, early land plants start to form. On December 20th, first four-limbed animals start to form. And now we are on the Christmas Eve, December 24th. This is when dinosaurs start to appear. Christmas day, December 25th, first mammalian ancestors. So our first ancestors start to appear. Now we're gonna go to December 29th. This is the global extension event that led the extinction of the dinosaurs, December 29th, just two days after New Year's Eve. And now we are on New Year's Eve day. So at 10, 15 a.m. in the morning, the apes start to appear. We are on the last day of the year immediately. 9.24 p.m., first human ancestors start to walk upright. 10.48, Homo erectus start to appear. 11.54, six minutes before midnight, anatom anat uh, anatomically modern humans appear, so Homo sapiens. 11.59.45, so 15 seconds before midnight, invention of writing. 11.59.50, 10 seconds before midnight, pyramids built in Egypt. And just one second before midnight, the voyage of Christopher Columbus started. So the, the, the life on Earth that, was cap that is capable of space exploration and uh, space communication, which started maybe 100 years ago, 100 years ago, is less than a fraction of a second compared to the age of the universe. So if an intelligent civilization pop up for a second somewhere in the galaxy and then disappear, and then another one pop up in the galaxy and disappear, it could be very improbable of two intelligent lives to coexist. Actually, I tried to get a rough estimate of the probability of two lives existing. It is one over 31 million, given that intelligent lives don't last too long. But of course, because there could be billions of potential life harboring planets, this probability could be much larger. It could be that the universe is too big for us to like communicate or find each other. As I said, the Milky Way alone is 100,000 light years across. So a lot of people think, okay, humans have been leaking radio broadcasts for like 100 years now, since the early radio broadcast started in the early 1900s. You know how much this traveled compared to the size of the galaxy, because a lot of people think, oh, we've been leading radio broadcasts. Someone should have found this radio broadcast, captured it, and they should reply to us. Well, if you look here, how much the radio broadcast or the extent of human radio broadcast, how much it traveled, you see this black box? Well, you see this blue dot inside this black box? This is how much radio, radio, radio broadcast has traveled in our galaxy. So imagine there is an intelligent civilization somewhere here or even outside of the box or on the other side of the galaxy. It will take hundreds of thousands or thousands of years for them to receive of, uh, receive of uh, our radio broadcast and then for them to reply to us another few thousand years. So the universe is too big for us to communicate even using the speed of light. It could be that we haven't been also listening enough because there's this project called the SETI, Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence. And uh, SETI is an area of radio telescopes that are pointed to, sky, to the sky to try to capture any radio signal from intelligent civilization. But we haven't been do, doing, do, doing this for only a few decades, and therefore we haven't been listening enough to rule out the presence of any intelligent life. Also, it could be that no one is transmitting, like they could be out there, they're just not transmitting, or they're using completely different technology that we use. We don't know. 
and they could be out there and not interested. I mean, we feel so entitled that if there is an intelligent civilization out there, they should be interested in us. Why? If they are so advanced compared to us, they might be just not interested. Think of it like if there are some ants on the sidewalk or uh, on, the, on the highway, for example, and you're driving on the highway and you see these ants, would you stop and try to like introduce yourself to these ants and explain yourself to them and introduce them to your technology? Probably not. If you're working on the sidewalk, most likely you'd step over these ants. So if they are too advanced, maybe it's better for us that they don't visit us because based on the history of the humans you know, on earth, when a more advanced, technologically advanced civilization visit less technologically advanced civilization, it's always bad news for the less technological advanced civilization. So maybe better if they don't visit us. Maybe they are just too alien for us. Maybe we like we always think of aliens that they have eyes and nose and ears and mouth. Yeah, it could be, but they could be also very alien that we don't even recognize them. I mean, there could be completely different form of life. Of course, we cannot search for a form of life that we are not familiar with. So we always search for a form of life that is similar to us, but they could be just too alien for us to recognize. And could be just too classified, but I don't think so. And you can ask me why later, why I don't think they are too, it's too classified. And the last option is that maybe nobody out there, which brings me to my last slide, a quote by Arthur C. Clarke, who says, two possibilities exist. Either we are alone in this universe, or we are not. And both are equally terrifying. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take some question now. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen, try to see. So they have a, a question from Caleb Miller, who's asking, do you expect Mars preserve, preserve Perseverance rover to find evidence of microbial life on Mars? So Mars uh, could, Mars has a thin atmosphere and uh, Mars might have had much thicker, much thicker atmosphere in the, in the past. And also there's a possibility that Mars had uh, uh, liquid water on its surface at some point in its history. And therefore there's a potential of life could have evolved on Mars. Now, is it possible that life, microbial life is present now on Mars? I think the conditions are too harsh on the Martian surface to have uh, my, microbial life uh, still present on, 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 on the lunar, on the Martian surface. It could be, but I think it's too harsh. But what I really hope is that Preservance Rover, which main aim is to search for any evidence for past life that have existed on the Martian surface. And the Preser Preservance rover has landed on a crater, which was, uh, uh, which was at some point during the Martian history, a lake with liquid water. And therefore it is a very probable place where life could have evolved at some point in the history of, uh, of, of Mars. And therefore I'm very hoping that in the near future, uh, the Perseverance rover would be able to find evidence for past life that existed on the lunar, on the Martian surface. And actually the rover will also take some samples from the Martian surface and put them in some tubes for future miss missions to pick up these samples and maybe bring them back on earth and also try to explore them and look for any potential life on these, on these uh, on the Martian surface. Uh, so I'll check on Facebook if there are any, any questions on the live feed. Uh, Okay, so there's a there is a, a question on uh, Facebook. Can you from Jamie Gerardo? Can you comment on the Drake equation as an estimation tool? Uh, so the Drake equation is a equation uh, that has been uh, 
put together by famous astronomer uh, uh, the, that uh, back in the maybe 18, maybe the 60s or no, maybe uh, later. But uh, anyway, uh, so Frank Drake uh, put this equation also, uh, again, not an equation to like get a very accurate estimate of the number of, of intelligent civilization, but just for, for fun to get a rough estimate of the number of uh, planets uh, on the uh, number, sorry, of intelligent civilization or intelligent life in the universe. Actually, I might have it as a slide. Yeah, I do have it as a slide. So I'm going to share my screen again. So this is Frank Drake who came up with this equation. So this is the, the, the Drake equation. And it tried to estimate the number of intelligent uh, civilization or technological advanced civilization by taking into consideration how many stars are formed on the galaxy or the star formation rate, or how many of these stars or the fraction of these stars that have planets around them, how many could have had a life, how many of them could have uh, uh, life evolving or like single cell organism, and then more advanced type of life, and then fraction of them that could have life uh, capable of uh, and, like space uh, exploration or space communication, or interstellar traveling, and then the period of time it takes for such a life to evolve. And if you put all of these together, you can try to come up with an estimate on the number of intelligent, civil, technologically advanced civilization in the, in the universe or in, in our galaxy. And of course, the number is expected to be large, but still the question is, where is everybody? Uh, I'm gonna see if there are any, any other questions in the chat, no. And okay, so I think that's it, and we are almost on time. It's 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 one in the afternoon. So thank you everyone for joining today in this uh, Expo Science, uh, MSU Science Festival Expo Day talk. Uh, I hope you enjoyed your time. And if you have any questions, please you can put them on Facebook in the comment section on the live post, and I would be happy to answer them later. Thank you very much.